Okay, so if anybody isn't aware, GP2016 has been out for a while, and as of December, they just did, they just released R2 of GP2016. So new features, of course, come with that, usually big enough to have them tag an R2 on the back end of it at that point. So there's there's a fair amount of them. Some of them stretching, uh, they stretch all the way across, you know, system-wide changes to to business intelligence changes to so it flickers there. I don't know why it loses things. But system-wide changes, financial enhancements, distribution, HR and payroll, project accounting. There were a couple others that showed up on here before it presented itself. Yeah, that is weird. Okay. So first feature to talk about is a system is a business intelligence change. And this is the ability to actually put a password on your smart list favorites. So if you've ever had anybody go in and start working with the smart list in the system and they made a change to it and now all of a sudden it breaks it for everybody else, you can actually put a password now that it would require somebody before they can go into smart list favorite and modify to make a change to it. And that's everything from changing the sorting of a column or anything. Anytime they go in and try to hit that modify button, it pops up and asks for the password. Okay. That's good in some controls, but it also was a pain as I was working and playing around with this the other day, is that let's say you set up a smart list favorite to my user ID. Okay, so I set it up for myself. It's my smart list and I love it and I'm sorting it, adding columns, doing whatever I want with it and it's just for myself. And that password still pops up anytime I try to modify it. So it's not where I want it to be yet just from everybody's standpoint, but it, it's getting there where it's gonna at least lock those down. So if you've got strict controls, on your favorites and you have a submission thing where if a favorite needs to be modified, somebody's submitting it to an individual and they go in and they make the change, then this password would be appropriate. But if you've got everybody kind of managing and making their own smart list favorites and you don't have it locked down to that, that point, then this is a, it's a pain at that point. So it's one of those things that they're getting on track though, putting that level of security on there to hopefully lock those things down at that point. So another one is now your uh, smart list designer smart lists are available in your drop downs. So who's using smart list designer? Got your feet wet, work with it at all whatsoever. So little bits along the way. So as you create new smart lists out there, okay, I've got a brand new smart list I designed out there for my customers and it's beautiful and it's great. And it would make perfect sense for our lookups when we go up and look up a customer, but we weren't able to surface it now. Now I'd add the new menu option there where we can actually go in and select our smart list designer created smart list for customers or vendors or items or whatever it may be, wherever we design that out there. And of course, remember with the version of GPs, they added that functionality to set as default view. So now we've got it where we've got smart list designer favorite set as a default view. So that surface now out there for us to be able to work with beforehand we couldn't get to them. We could create all our fancy smart lists and smart list favorites just out of the box, but whenever we created them with the smart list designer one, we couldn't actually surface it. Is it gonna go? There. Okay. So another thing that they added is for your management reporter, um, before now it was always just an HTTP for going out and getting any of your web deployed management reporter reports and just based off of individuals asking for a little bit more security behind there, now it supports HTTPS. So what that means is it's a secured connection which means that if somebody would hack your system they would have to have an extra layer of security to be able to get into those potentially at that point. So it just adds that extra layer on the HTTP to be able to get to your management reporters whenever they're deployed to a, a web environment. So another thing that added, and we saw this I think last time I showed it off while I was talking about the Power BI and things of that sort. So on the GP homepage in GP 2016, Power BI can now be surfaced on the client version R2 adds it for the web client. So if you've had, if you've even dove into Power BI yet or been interested in it, but you've got a strong web client base that would be interested in these things, they'll now have access to those too. So you can get a full, you know, full feel for 
the users that are logging in where they're, they're really not seeing much difference between the web client and the desktop client. They can have those Power BI reports show up on their desktop also. Batch error message, this is probably a nice one. Now if you get in and you try to get in and do something with a batch or work with a batch or post a batch or whatever it may be, it'll at least tell you the user that currently has that thing tied up. So you can go track them down at that point and profess all your feelings for them at that point of why they're using your batch that you're trying to post. So another thing that they added is on our financial side is for the sales and payables distribution line, will default to the display, the expanded display. So if you're constantly going into these windows and you're working with the distribution lines and you're always popping them down to do the distribution reference there, the next time that you hop into this window after you've done it the first time, it'll save that preference for you. So it's by user, it's not a system-wide setting or anything, but if I come in and I expand this down and I enter my distribution reference, so long as I don't scrunch it back before I say okay on there, it'll save that the next time I come in, it'll already be exploded for you so you can see the, the lines of detail. Credit limit, limit calculation now includes unposted credit documents. So the benefit there is you've got customer, you've got sales that you're trying to push through, and you know every time you push through a, a sales document, it looks for the customer's credit at that point. Well, let's say that, you know, you're battling with the AR team at that point, and the AR team is keying in cash receipts. Customer just had submitted a check, and they've got a cash receipt that's unposted at that moment sitting out on the AR side where the customer looks like they're paid up. But sales goes in and keys it in, and it pops up and says there's a credit limit warning, and now you've got to go through the hoops of calling the customer, and they say, well, I just sent you a check. It should be paid. What's, you know, what's going on? So now if you go in and you apply that cash receipt to that sales invoice, it considers it as part of the, the uh, credit limit at that point. So it'll go out and say, you know, if it's sitting out there as just an unapplied credit, it's still looking at those things. But here, at least, whenever it's applied to something, it kind of considers it within the posted table at that point. Where, you know, think of it this way. If you go in and you apply it and you unapply it, it's going to pop that credit limit warning whenever it's in an unapplied state. But so long as it's applied, it'll be considered in the credit limit warning calculation. So another on the financial side is purchase order processing links to your fixed assets now include taxes. So you have the option to include tax as part of your acquisition cost now for your fixed assets. That excites anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Diana probably does. I am excited about that. <laughs> another feature of the day they added is the link of credit card invoices to the original invoice. So they're just giving you more information. If you're actively using credit card payments in your system, and whenever you create those, great. Okay, it, it takes care of one payables, but it creates another one at that point. And sometimes tracking all the way back to all the stuff that's linked together with a credit card payment is a pain. So they've added into this version where it's going to add the transaction description as the voucher number and the actual vendor that it was paid against whenever it creates these. So your Amex line out there will actually display, here's who we paid, here's the vendor that we paid with that specific one. The other beautiful thing is they added it into the Reconcile to GL Excel document too. So those things will come out and be linked whenever you run a Reconcile to GL for your payables management. Another one is Bank Reconciliation Tracks History Now. Who has a bank rec that takes forever to run? Anybody? I think I've heard it a couple of times where whenever you go in and you try to do a bank reconciliation, it takes a while because there's a lot of stuff to go through. They now have the ability to move open to history now, kind of like you run into on the purchasing side and things like that where you can move open transactions to the history. So we get this new window to be able to work with where we can go in and, okay, any reconciled transactions that have been out there based on a date, push those over to the history table. That way when we're running through and saying we want to reconcile, it doesn't have to run through so much data that's already been reconciled at that point. You think about your data table growing over time, even though you've reconciled it and there's a little flag in there that says so, it still takes a while to run through. Uh, comparison that I give with that one is anytime you run like a historical inventory trial balance, you know, it takes forever. So same idea here, they're moving those things to another table, which means that when the process runs of the reconciliation, it's only looking at the open stuff and all the stuff that we've moved off cleanly 
doesn't get touched in that lookup. So it should speed things up if you're having any issues with those. So another exciting thing that they've added out here is the ability to enter a suffix for a fixed asset. And that gives us the ability to basically have multiple versions, different uh, asset IDs for or multiple, multiple versions of an asset ID. Hey, Sean. Yeah. That's not new to 2016. Are you sure? Yeah. That's something. <laughs> so a fixed asset other than one can be entered and saved. The enhancement can help you group assets and components. So yeah, that's, I don't know why it showed up in their group yeah, of. Yeah, I know. That's weird. I'm just pointing that out. No, that's yeah. absolutely. I was, thank you. All right, so another one that they've added is the safe pay file. Now displays the check name from the vendor setup, not from the actual vendor name. So if you have a different check name for your vendor versus the actual name of the vendor, now whenever you run safe pay through the system, it'll pull the check name value versus the name from the vendor. So if that's ever been an issue for anyone, now they actually have it pulling from the place that you would assume would come for the check. How do I get to manufacturing? Sorry, Audrey. Somebody tell Audrey that I didn't really mean to ignore her. <laughs> All right. So another one that they have is the ability to display tax percentages for the historical transactions. So now when you drill down to tax details on a sales transaction or a purchasing transaction and things like that, it will actually tell you the percent that was used for that tax calculation, whereas before it was a pain to find it. So it will display that set up on the tax, it'll display what was used here at the time that the transaction was put through versus what was what's actually set up on it. So if your tax rate has changed since this transaction was entered in, it keeps a history of that. It, it sets it in a field so it's saved with it. Uh, anybody using requisitions to date? Step into that yet? Okay. So one of the things that I ran into just in uh, you know demoing this, showing it, during implementations and things of that, any time that I would create a requisition in GP and then link it to a purchase order, generate the PO from it, it would do the same thing that you would get in the sales side. If you created a PO from a sales transaction, you get that little link on there that is linking my requisition to my purchase order. One of the deficiencies that they had in here was that it would not allow you to delete that, cancel that PO line at that point if it was linked to it. It just stopped. It wouldn't do it. So it was it was a pain to kind of navigate around and you know there was there was always that lingering question, are you sure you want to purchase this? Are you really sure you want to purchase this? So now you can cancel those things and it'll just give you that that ability to uh, to cancel those things off and it will warn you so of so as you as you move through that process of canceling a quantity for that line. Another one on the human resources side and payroll. Uh, track history of termination and hiring and rehire dates in human resources. So now it'll actually keep track of when they started, when they left, when they came back, what their last day was. So it's got different tracking capabilities out there for for those for employment history. Whenever you look at it, so the four that it's got now is an adjusted hire date, a date inactivated, last day that they worked, and then a termination date. And of course, you've got the hire date at their form too. So just additional date fields for tracking your employment for your individuals. This is a big one. This is exciting for people who hate buying pre-printed forms for W-2 on the payroll side. They have now added a new form that we can choose at the time of printing W-2s where it's one wide forms with boxes and they already have a, a format out here to match the W-2. So you can print W-2s from your system already formatted, looking pretty with all the lines and everything that you need them to without actually having to buy the pre-printed form. So they have that out of the box and obviously this is in the GP report writer which means that if we have to do any type of design work to that whatsoever for some reason, we can make changes to that. But they do have that now available to, to go with instead of using pre-printed forms for your W-2s. Another thing that they've added on the human resources payroll side is the ability to assign a vendor address and account number 
whenever you, whenever you have any type of vendor that's tied to your payroll side. And where I think that this comes into handy is, okay, you've got a vendor that you're using for federal tax in this case that may be used for tax elsewhere in the system. Well, you want a specific GL account for that to specifically hit at that point. But this allows you to set up, okay, we're going to pay that vendor address and we want it to affect that specific GL account at that point. So it's just added these specific fields to the, uh, the vendor payroll side whenever you're configuring those. Another one is that they've got payroll integrated with accounts payable now for the 1099 information. So now it allows us to actually, as these things pull over, we've got the 1099 amount in here where now we've got the tax type and the 1099 box. So if the, the employee on the one side is a 1099, it will push that information through and have that information populated. So they've added the, the 1099 entry box integration here for those. So a couple that I, and these were just, they were mentioned on there, and for the life of me, I don't have the, what I need set up to be able to actually get into these, but if anybody ta uh, tracks tips and tax tips amounts, um, those are now available in your pre-posting reports, whereas, be whereas before, uh, those were not available prior to posting in the module, so now it will actually display those in your pre-posting reports before you post payroll. And then the other one is a, a warning to prevent man uh, mandatory errors uh, or errors duplicating posting. So the new functionality for the deductions. I don't know either. Just does not want to stay right. I'm getting a flicker on there. But now it'll uh, allow a warning to show those different things so that you don't end up uh, posting another deduction code that have already previously been posted at that point. You have a timesheet status report now that you can push out of the system. So on your PA side, you can actually push this out, and it will give you a status of specific employees who have timesheets that are not submitted, where they're pending user action or if they're rejected. So you can run this and print by status or by approver at that point. So if you have any timesheets that are stuck in the approval processes in the system, you now have a report that they've given you to be able to run that to find out where specific timesheets are sitting and who has yet to approve that for getting those timesheets pushed through. Next one is on the project accounting side, and that's the PA line distributions added for each transaction. So now when we get into these, now whenever we're doing individual lines on a timesheet entry, you can actually get into the lines of that timesheet and work with the GL accounts that are in there. So it added the button to be able to get into the line distributions and be able to nudge the, the GL accounts if you need to on those. Beforehand, it was always tied to the cross category itself. But here, you can actually make changes to it by transaction at that point. <laughs> 